and you can see them with their hands up as they move through here to get them off campus. We're told that the school is in lockdown, but we see this from time to time in situations like this. You can see here the sheriff's bringing another tactical vehicle into the scene here. Uh, but to get back to that parent, she had just heard that her son is OK, and he was telling her that right now they are in lockdown. A very tense situation for a lot of these parents out here wondering where their children are. A lot of them trying to text with their kids. We've confirmed an active shooter, uh, at least one on campus. We don't know much more than that. Has she said anything about what's going on inside the school right now? Uh, she has not. She has not. She says she can't talk on the phone. She's okay. That was yeah. after multiple phone calls to her. Looking around, you see lots of parents and students here. Describe to us the general feeling in the air. Fear. Fear. Uh, I found out it was in the gym, was the shooting, and that's where I would have been if I was at school, so I'm, I'm glad I missed the bus. Um, my sister's in there. I've called her a bunch of times, but she hasn't picked up. This is from the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office this morning, uh, reporting that the situation has stabilized. That is uh, their word. It's stabilized and that the shooter is dead. They are moving the area where they are reuniting kids with their parents to the Fred Meyer in, uh, it's called the Wood Village Fred Meyer, Northeast 223rd and Gleason Street. That is where they want parents to go now. Today uh, is a very tragic day for the city of Troutdale and Reynolds School District. A gunman entered the high school this morning, shot one student. Unfortunately, that student has died. The gunman was located and the gunman is also deceased. You can see the concern on people's faces. They're all waiting right at the, the edge here and um, <laughs> waiting for their kids. Uh, the buses have arrived, uh, the first wave, uh, but we don't know exactly how long it'll be before uh, they begin to get kids with their parents. In the meantime, you see faces like this with this nice woman with her hand up to her mouth. And what's, what, what are you waiting for and how are you doing? Just want to hug my girl. Who is she? Cheyenne. And she goes to Reynolds. She's a junior. Yeah, tell, tell me what you know. Um, she said she's okay. She's with a group of friends that are all okay and that they're getting ready to get on buses. We just heard a press conference where we learned that the shooter is dead, but one student is dead as well. What's your reaction? Pray for their family. Just don't want to know who it is. When you woke up this morning, you didn't expect a day like this, did you? Hearing that news, what does that make you feel about your daughter and knowing that she's okay and what you plan to do with her when you get to her? I just want to hold her. Just want to hold her tight and get her home. We wish you and Cheyenne the best. Thank you. I don't think I want to bother anybody else right now. I think that pretty much says it for the kind of reaction you're going to be hearing from all these parents, a lot of them with tears in their eyes. This is still an ongoing investigation. We've seen evidence of that just a few minutes ago. We saw heavily armed tactical teams or CERT teams moving through the parking lot, checking vehicle after vehicle, just looking in the windows to make sure there's nothing suspicious. You can see some officers that are staged in multiple points, and we've seen that throughout the duration of this situation. As police responded, they set up posts around campus to make sure the students are safe and secure, and obviously at the time there was concern about an active shooter. Uh, we have uh, several thousand parents here already. Um, you know, the, the kids are being loaded on the buses. They're en route here now. The very, very important, and once you get down here, this needs to be an orderly process in order for us to get the kids back to their parents and, and loved ones safely. Uh, what they don't want to do is have parents rush the, the area to their child, as emotional as this is, as uh, right as that might feel to do. They've just got to keep everybody safe and make sure that uh, nobody gets tripped up and that the students go to the, the right families. Amazingly orderly when you consider all the angst and aggravation and everything these parents have experienced this morning. And now we'd see this woman expressing her emotion, almost cheering at the sight of, of her child. Just for a moment, tell me what's it, what it's like to be back with your mom. Oh, it feels great to be back with her. Uh, pretty scary over there. Yeah. Tell me about it a little bit. What what did you experience? Uh, well, we just saw people running everywhere, like people screaming. We didn't know what was going on, and we just all went to the back of the classroom. We were all scared. Suddenly, I heard a bunch of <laughs> shots, but at first, I thought they were firecrackers because they were too fast and too short of a period of time. We were going in for seventh period and 
semifinals, and there was just a bunch. There was two shots after we were all meeting in the gym, and I, I saw one of them run by us as we were running to our weight room thing, and he had no mask on and just see the side of his face. And did you see him carrying a gun? How do you know yeah, it's one of them? He was he was carrying a gun, running after one of our teachers, our PE teacher, Mr. Rispler, who actually ended up getting shot. He was, as I understand from other staff members who I've been in contact with, grazed on the hip by a bullet, and he is okay. And it just makes me, you know, choke up right now thinking about it because, you know, to have to have someone like him in harm's way, and to to know that there was a possibility that another senseless killing could have happened today, you know, and it was him, it just. It blows my mind, and I'm so relieved he's okay, and my heart just goes out to the student and the, the family of the, the student who is, who is not okay. Tell us about the moment you saw your parents when you got here, Eric. Uh, it was, they, were, they were pretty scared. They just, they just, they, my mom, I knew my mom was almost going to cry. I hugged them, and then I said, why are you crying? I'm fine. It makes you love everybody you know, you know? We're the only society, we're the only developed country on earth where this happens. And it happens now once a week. And it's a one day story. There's no place else like this. Tonight I must share some sad news that we have identified the victim in today's shooting as 14 year old Emilio Hoffman, a freshman at Reynolds High School. 14-year-old Emilio was just a great kid, a good soccer player. There's been a lot of tweets and mm -hmm. certainly Facebook posts from all of his friends, and there were many, many people who really just adored him. News Channel 8's Chris Willis was first to identify the victim today after speaking with a family spokesperson. And Chris joins us now with more on this 14-year-old freshman who died today. Well, Joe, his family says Emilio Hoffman was a great kid and loved by all. That Two vigils tonight, 7.30 at the Greater Portland Baptist Church and 9 o'clock on the soccer field at Walt Morey Middle School. Which is here in Troutdale. It is closer. Exactly. And just to point out, too, that crisis counselors are available at Mount Hood Community College until 7 o'clock tonight and then again until from 7 a.m. till 7 p.m. tomorrow. And it appears they may have extended that. The last I heard it was 7 tonight. It may be 9 tonight. But I know we also have counselors standing by back at KGW in our newsroom, open and willing and ready to talk to folks online right now if you have questions about how to talk to your kids about what happened here today. You know, the web chat is going on right now. We have the professionals who are here in one of our conference rooms who are able to answer questions of people here. You know, one of the things that they're finding out is a lot of the questions really kind of center around how people will talk to their younger children about this to get them to understand exactly what's going on and make sure that they understand that they are going to be able to be safe. News Channel 8 at 6 starts now. Hello everyone, I'm live here on the campus of the University of Oregon where outrage continues to grow over the rape allegations involving three basketball players. Students today rallied, they marched, they asked tough questions. Among them, they want to know who's getting more support here, a University of Oregon student who says she was raped or the basketball players who stand accused. We have team coverage tonight. Joining me right now is Kylie Boshi, who you were at that rally today, and it was a very loud uh, turnout. Indeed, Tracy. News generated five starts now. Don't drink the water. Hundreds of thousands of people in Portland and beyond forced to boil everything. Our primary concern is public health. And then the rush on water. Store shelves empty in minutes. I got the, the only water that was left, which was in the refrigerated section, and about four times more expensive. Businesses forced to resort to Plan B, and it's all just in time for the holiday weekend. The danger, E. coli found in the water supply. In fact, turning up at some of these reservoirs right here at Mount Tabor. I'm Tracy Berry, and tonight we're going to take a look at how something like this could happen, shutting down the water supply of an entire city and find out what this says about our water supply. 
I'm Joe Donlin. This is where everyone rushed after that boil order went out this morning. Within an hour of that alert, this shelf that had gallons of water was empty. As you can see, they still have plenty here in the form of packaged bottled water, but we've been seeing people like this all afternoon, streaming through, many of them coming just for the water. Let's check in with Dave Norfield. He's been out and about at the stores. Dave, it was pretty chaotic today. Oh my gosh, can you believe it? There is just two days of competition left after tonight's action in the 22nd Winter Games. Good evening, welcome to the Ozone. I'm Tracy Berry. And I'm Joe Donlin. That means only two nights left to see this. A live look at the Olympic flame burning over Sochi. Okay, tonight on the show, a behind the scenes look at how those hundreds and hundreds of hours of NBC coverage come together. See how the events on the snow and ice end up on your TV and probably your digital device as well. Also, what's ahead for the Olympic Park? We'll show you what the Russian government plans to do with all those expensive venues now. And the oldest athlete at the games may have one of the most unusual backgrounds, not to mention uniforms. I love this guy. Mexico's royal <laughs> skier coming up in a few minutes. First, though, one of the most eagerly awaited matchups of these games. Laurel Porter is here with highlights of the U.S. versus Canada, men's hockey game, and more. This game was only the semifinals, but it had all the feeling of a gold medal matchup. Two teams that don't like each other, one of hockey's highlight matchups. So how much do you love the Olympics? Enough to maybe sit down and watch them with your family, but would you ever fly halfway across the world to see them? Our own Steph Strickland is in Sochi this morning. She did it. Steph, you met up with a Hillsborough couple who did the same. You're working, they're not. <laughs> It's so great to be over here and to have someone from home walk up and say, Steph, especially when it's sometimes logistically hard to connect with people back home. There's lots of security. You have to have passes and tickets, not to mention just the whole scale of this place, trying to get that done. But that's exactly what happened for me. So I'm thrilled to tell you about the folks who traveled 6,000 plus miles to be here. If you're a Ducks fan, you're just counting down the days until the Rose Bowl. Our Joe Donlin is in Pasadena for us tonight at the Rose Bowl Stadium, where fans are already starting the tailgate party. Joe, how's it going in California? I hear it's glad that you brought your rain gear. Yes, no question about that, Laurel. I can't complain, though. I mean, my gosh, we're in California. We're playing Florida State. We're from Oregon. We're supposed to be used to this kind of weather, but frankly, it's rainy and cold. So. Live from KGW, this is Friday Night Flights, brought to you by Carl's Jr. Good evening. We're closing out September with a jam-packed edition of Friday Night Flights, and we start with a Metro League rivalry, the 3-0 Westview Wildcats hosting Beaverton. Art Edwards was at our Game of the Week. The team's ready for action in this one. We knew when the teams took the field, this could be a wild one. So then you get entered even more and more into more raffles depending on how many purchases you make. Back to you. And I love raffles. Thank yes. you, Erica. <laughs> you bet. Stick around. Coming up next, protests continue in Portland and across the country in response to the grand jury decision in Ferguson. These are live pictures in Portland. We break down the shooting timeline, which happened in less than a minute. That's when our live team coverage continues. Well, it looks like we're seeing some, it's not quite as peaceful as we yes. seen earlier. Uh, police have moved in here now. Um, and it looks like they're trying to stop these demonstrators from moving. What's that, Paul? They're on the Morrison Bridge, we're being told now. I'm by here, our you can hear me, can Paul. you hear me? Kenny, um, yeah, Pat, like is that have... you? Can you hear me? Is that Mike Benner? Go ahead, Mike, we can hear you. 
I'm here, guys. We're here uh, right at the uh, base of the Morrison Bridge, and uh, things have gotten a little uh, rowdy here as we see uh, police officers with riot gear. There's been a little contact between protesters and rioters, or excuse me, uh, protesters and police. There you go, right there. He is getting a little violent here. Oh, my cameraman just went down. Stand, stand by here. Stand by here. Stand by here. I'm holding the camera here. My uh, photo tag has just gone down. Stay with us. He's up. If you're still with us here, uh, again, we're at the base of the Morrison. Things were very, very, very peaceful from the majority of this afternoon, but about a half hour ago, there was a number of protesters who broke off from the crowd and uh, went on their own march, and it has come to a head here at the base of the Morrison Bridge. We have officers in riot, in, uh, riot gear and now a loudspeaker trying to make out what they're trying to say. They say they need to vacate the roadway. Again, this started out as a peaceful march around 4 o'clock. The Urban League involved in the planning of this. And within the last half hour or so, things have taken a turn. And it's come to a, a head here at the base of the Morrison Bridge. We have more uh, officers arriving on motorcycles right now. And now protesters have continued down Southwest 2nd. There's still a few uh, protesters here trying to taunt uh, the officers, but the officers are staying their ground. Here's this blue car here. It's the lead car going from the westbound to the east side, and it cannot get uh, through this uh, through the traffic of all these protesters here. And again, officers reminding protesters that this bridge is open to traffic, but uh, at this point, they're not really listening. You're the one that started this uh, this group of protesters going in this direction. Tell me the other reason behind it. Well, we kind of felt like we got robbed. You know, this is this is the night to take the streets, and instead there was a lot of singing and a lot of marching for no reason, and so the people were just mad. Like everybody did it. It wasn't just like me. It was everybody was angry, and and they were just tired. Do you not think that the rally from four till six or six fifteen did the trick tonight? That was like just a bunch of people giving speeches so they could hear themselves talk. I'm going to send it back to you momentarily. Uh, things get a little hectic in this uh, in this corner, so uh, stay with us here. Okay. Mike, thanks. If we can uh, maybe stay with Mike's oh, picture here, see what he's talking about. Because oh, 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 someone's just getting punished. hit here in a car. Someone's we're getting hit. Problem. He's getting out. He's getting out. This, hey, hey, this is... Uh, hold on here. We need some police. He actually might have some blood here. Let me ask if we can see what happened. I Sir, attacked on my card. Can we ask you what happened? No, get out of my face. Appears that he doesn't want to talk as far as what happened, but he is uh, reporting it to uh, dispatch, it sounds, uh, sounds right now. Protesters now kind of around the police vehicle. Some of them kind of pounding the side of it. The mounted patrol kind of flanking them on one side. Demonstrators continue past. Didn't seem to stop right here with police. Oh, here come the mounted patrol. They're moving in at the moment. It appears to try to cut off this crowd as they continue to march. We're kind of midstream here, midway back. We're trying to work our way up front, but there are a lot of folks here. Uh, things certainly starting to liven up at the moment. The crowd really kind of elevating their voice. Oh, now they're splitting off. Looks like some of them are splitting off eastbound here. Nope, they're continuing. We'll work our way up towards towards the front right here. You guys can see the mounted patrol up here. It appears police are kind of trying to take a stand right here for the moment. Several officers on their bikes as well getting off. Again, seemingly to, to make a stand at this one location. I'm trying to see a street sign. I don't know exactly where we're at, essentially under the freeway at the moment. Comes our cameraman walking off on the side as police. Oh, there goes the gentleman right there. He just hopped over into the freeway right there. You can see him. Oh. If we pan right, our camera right, to the right here, John, we can see folks. You can see folks in the in the freeway right there. We're gonna walk up here, guys. Uh, look at look at all these folks on the freeway right now. They're literally jumping the barrier onto the freeway. Now they're walking against traffic on the freeway at the moment. Uh, kind of a surreal scene here, but they effectively shut down traffic. 
Uh, we want you to continue your commentary for us, Mike, but as, as we do, we just want to let people know and, and let you know, we're looking at Sky 8 pictures right now of the freeway with cars stopped on the freeway, and it looks to be a handful of protesters standing their ground in front of the cars. Is that what you're seeing, Yeah, Joe? clearly, and then you just saw a car zip by on the shoulder there, almost hitting one of the, the protesters in the middle of the highway, and this is what everyone worries about. And, you know, the sad thing is, I mean, we, we see this, and... These folks on the freeway there, you know, are put in a situation where, you know, these folks want to make their point and everyone understands and many of them certainly agree with their, their, their message, but it's, it's the tactics that, that tend to cause problems with folks who are now blocking an entire freeway to make their point. This is the way they see uh, of doing it. Again, we heard them moments ago saying, if you try to get on the freeway, we're going to arrest you. And it seems like this is kind of where they're setting up to try to corral this group and keep them from getting onto the freeway and disrupting traffic. And number two, putting themselves in danger. Back behind me, you can see how they've set up a line of bicycle officers here, pushing these demonstrators back onto the sidewalk. They've been requesting them to do so for quite some time through these loudspeakers, and now they've taken position to try and keep these individuals on the sidewalk. At this point, it appears that these demonstrators are following those requests. The large crowd that we saw out here maybe 15, 20 minutes ago, the majority of them, after being told to get off the street, did indeed do so. Uh, those that didn't, it appears, were arrested. Um, maybe two, maybe three of them. And at this point, uh, the majority of the crowd has left, and now police seem to be clearing out a little bit as well. From KGW News, this is a special presentation. Your heroes. They inspire us. I choose the career that they don't think that I can do and then do it. They make us laugh. Oh. <laughs> and they give us hope. I think it's changed him forever. They are everyday people. Our neighbors, our co-workers, our friends. They are your heroes. Hello everyone, I'm Tracy Berry. This holiday season, we'd like to recognize the people in our community who are making a difference, not just at this time of year, but all year long. Tonight, we're sharing just some of their stories with you. This year, we learned heroes come in all ages. As Landon Clark shows us, his curiosity and love of one special zoo resident are proving you're never too young to change the world. The KGW Great Food Drive is off to a great start. So far, we've collected almost 74,000 pounds of food for the food drive. Today, Laurel Porter and Nick Allard were out at West Hollywood Fred Meyer collecting donations and giving out movie passes to folks who helped out. Our goal is to collect 600,000 pounds of food for the Oregon Food Bank. Scanner. Hello, shoppers. This is Laurel Porter from KGW Television. I'm also one of your neighbors. I shop here at the Fred Meyer. But I'm here today because of the KGW Great Food Drive. All right, you can help by buying Tillamook cheese, or you can donate food or cash at any U.S. bank. If you donate 10 cans of food at area Toyota dealerships, you'll get $10 off parts and service. You can also donate at KGW.com. We'll be right back. If it was a disease, we'd call it an epidemic. The need continues to grow. We're still seeing new faces every week. We should be shocked when we hear one in five. Most of us are just one paycheck away from having to go ask for that food ourselves. Kids really pull on your heartstrings. The food drive means community. We know it saved a lot of lives. When you give food, it's gonna go straight into a box. It's not just feeding hunger, it's feeding hope. Tillamook has been involved for many years, and we know that the KGW Great Food Drive is making a difference. During the month of March, buy any variety of Tillamook cheese, and we'll donate a portion of the proceeds to the KGW Great Food Drive. If we all just gave something. Imagine the difference we can make. The sky's the limit. Let's go for two million pounds, three million pounds. Let's go after whatever it is that we can get because we need it. We're back now with the talk box and tonight we're celebrating the huge success of the KGW Great Food Drive. Because of you, everyone out there watching who helped out, you made a 
big difference in the amount of food that's available to feed families in need here in Oregon and Southwest Washington. Laura Galino De Lovato from the Oregon Food Bank is here to talk about just how much of an impact that will make. Thanks for coming down. Oh, thank you. Now, I have not actually seen where the numbers stand right now. So you're about to tell me and everyone else where we're at. How did we do? We did great. It was another successful year. The goal was 600,000 pounds. We are right now at 791,000 with final totals to be uh, done on Friday. A crowded hallway can be a lonely place when you think no one understands you. I actually had a rope and pills. It's often hard to see the pain under the surface. You never know what someone could be going through. Sometimes that pain boils over. Uh, there may be as many as two suspects inside. How do you stop a threat that seems unstoppable? One 17-year-old girl had an idea. An idea that's taking off in our schools and changing lives. And it just made me realize that everybody's so special and you should treat everybody with respect. I'm so lucky that so many people care for me. Tonight, News Channel 8 and Sterling Bank bring you a special presentation. Rachel's Challenge, inspiring compassion in our children. Here's Tracy Berry. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being with us tonight. We really hope that in the next half hour, you might find a little inspiration to try to make the world a better place. And if you don't think that one person can make a difference, then you have never heard of Rachel Scott, the lovely teen, was the first person to die in the Columbine High School shooting. But that is not her legacy. Today, we remember her as the first person in a chain reaction of kindness. There are videos that could be anyone's child, a smiling little girl whose kind heart shined bright. She looked for the best and found it. Rachel reached out to kids who were different. She stood up for kids who were picked on. And that generous spirit did not die when her life was taken at 17. Today, her family, friends, even people who didn't know her, carry her message of everyday compassion to millions around the world. Dozens of schools around our area have taken Rachel's challenge. Broadway Middle School and Seaside took the message beyond their school walls. They carried signs and posters to spread the word about their Friends of Rachel Club, which was started by just three seniors at nearby Seaside High. And another group is, who has taken on the challenge, Rachel's challenge, is Liberty High School. And boy, talk about active. They meet once a week to come together and think up new ways to embrace that concept of kindness. So I'd like you to meet them now, our friends of Rachel. Yeah. What kind of message do you give to the students who are kind of in a funk or going through a crisis? Well, in all honesty, I, I sit there and I'll listen to them for quite a while just because they need to be heard and they need to show that, well, they just need to tell their story. But in the end, it's one day and they need to know that even though what they're going through, there is much more life to be lived. And so we would just work together and try to figure out, not necessarily fix the situation, but how can we cope with it? How can we move forward? And Knowledge Universe, let's go. School Supply. Drive. School Supply. Drive. Knowledge Universe has the spirit. How about you? One out of two kids starts the year off without the necessary school supplies. Our classrooms need your help. Let's rally together and get the kids what they need. Your donations will send kids back to school ready to learn. When we all come together, we do make a difference. The KGW School Supply Drive, brought to you by Knowledge Universe. And the KGW School Supply Drive is now underway. We want to make sure all kids go back to school ready to learn, but we can't do it without you. To help, you can donate cash or supplies at any on-point community credit union or 30 kinder care centers. At Toyota dealerships, if you donate $5 or more of supplies, 
you'll get $10 off your parts or service. And as always, you can pledge your gift online at KGW.com through the end of this month. Pencil Pete, we're on a mission. Get kids back to school with school supplies they need. Right now, when you donate cash at KGW.com or any on-point location, your local Toyota dealers will add $25 worth of school supplies to your donation, making your donations go further. Pencil Pete, it's time to bring the heat. So please, make your donation today. They are all here today to help with all the supplies that have been brought to our studio today. Lots of organizations, lots of businesses collecting for us the last four weeks. So today we brought in a whole lot more school supplies and now we have enough supplies in house to send 7,500 91 kids back to school with all the supplies they need to navigate through that school year successfully. Stephanie, you just mentioned the goal being 8,000. So last time I checked, 7,591 is pretty darn close to meeting that goal. But we're not done. Monday marks the official end of this year's KGW School Supply Drive. So we'll keep accepting your donations. Be those donations actual supplies or be those donations cash. You can make donations throughout our area. We'll explain exactly where again in a moment. Sitting down and opening up. Is there a cover-up when it comes to Cover Oregon? Look, Laurel, no one is more angry about this than I am. Oregon Governor John Kitzhaber joins us for an exclusive interview, his longest on camera since the failed launch of the Cover Oregon website. To have such a colossal flop seems unbelievable to a lot of people. What he knew when and what he plans to do next about the health care exchange, plus the Columbia River crossing, and the trend toward legalizing marijuana. From News Channel 8, this is Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight for Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. Tonight, our exclusive interview with Oregon Governor John Kitzhaber. We sat down earlier this week to talk about Cover Oregon, the CRC, and why he decided to run for a fourth term. Oregonians have a choice this November. Should Democrat John Kitzhaber get four more years leading the state? Or is it time for a change with Republican Dennis Richardson? Both candidates have long political records and are trying to position themselves as leaders who can grow Oregon's economy. Kitzhaber was an emergency room doctor before entering politics and campaigns on his leadership with health care policy. Well, I think we've done a really good job together over the last three years, but the fact is uh, Oregon won't be a good place for any of us to live unless it's a good place for all of us to live. If Kitzhaber is elected, he would become the only person in Oregon history to serve four terms as governor. Richardson wants to make sure that doesn't happen. The state representative from Southern Oregon is well known in Salem and has worked to build his image in the Portland metro area. I am concerned about our state and about its future. I'm concerned about the ability to work and the ability to have uh, a, a job that, and, and to restore the legacy that we were given by our pioneer forebears. Tonight, you have a chance to hear from both Richardson and Kitsabin as they are pressed on their positions by a panel of journalists from KGW and the Oregonian. From the KGW studios in Portland, this is Decision 2014. The debate for Oregon's governor. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Decision 2014, the Oregon governor's race. I'm Tracy Berry. Good evening, everyone. We're going to take just a couple of minutes to update you on our special election coverage from KGW. We are following the big races tonight, including the race for Oregon's governor, and that's where we will begin. The Oregonian just moments ago has called this race for Governor Kitzhaber. Kyle joins us right now. Kyle, have you seen him yet? Joe Tracy, we have not seen the governor. But if anybody knows that a challenger can knock off an incumbent, it is Senator Merkler. She arrived here just about 7 o'clock, has been kind of waiting for results at the end of the hall. She thinks this is the first step in a national GMO measure. But again, this race too close to call right now. As this goes on, they are feeling, I think, a little bit more excited. 
I would say that of all of the hashtags tonight locally, and this is no big surprise, hashtag Measure 91 has been the most popular and perhaps the most creative. Let's head over to Laurel Porter, who has some great analysis. We have a really exciting panel with us. We have Sheila Hamilton from Kink Radio representing the left and representing the right. Rob Kramer from KXL Radio. Thanks for joining us on the panel. Thank you. Len Pleasure. Bergstein, our KGW analyst, is here with us too. You've seen him earlier. And chime in, Len, if you want to jump into some of this conversation. Oregon, a land of adventure and awe. A treasure. That was a great thing. Majestic and hidden. A state that calls out for exploration and experience. The journey of discovery begins now. From KGW, this is Grant's Getaways. Hi there, I'm Grant McComey, KGW News Outdoor Reporter, and welcome to KGW and Travel Oregon's Grant's Getaways Holiday Special. A full hour of our outdoor stories exploring Oregon's people, places, and outdoor adventures. We grab rods, reels, and waders and join a river adventure bobber dogging for Oregon's winter steelhead. And we take you to the Willamette Valley, where a wintertime convocation of eagles is something special to see. And it was year of the salmon across Oregon's coastal bays and rivers. It's an abundance that led to generosity in one community. We meet the salmon saviors, who give time, energy, and money to meet the needs of their neighbors. And Dungeness crabbing season's underway. We visit a unique Oregon business that holds on to heritage, what it takes to catch and serve Dungeness crabs. Plus much, much more. Out here, the wisdom of the open road speaks the loudest. And Oregon's vast landscapes have stories to tell. From the timeless echoes of covered bridges to the soul-stirring vistas of Hell's Canyon. These roads are an invitation to discovery. We all ask what's out there, but only a few go find out. This year, take the road trip of a lifetime on Oregon's scenic byways. Have you looked at the calendar? We're exactly six weeks away from Christmas Day, no. which means it's time to get this year's KGW Great Toy Drive into motion. It really comes down to our viewers stepping up as they have over the years. We need you to step up again. Uh, real quickly, just to give people an idea, because I know a lot of people make the donation. They know they're giving the toys. They drop off that new unwrapped toy at any of these locations, but they may wonder, where do they go from there? So how do we get these toys into the uh, the right kids' hands, if that makes any sense? Oh, well, we have a big celebration at Friends of the Children. Our gym is filled with the wonderful toys that people provide. We have a huge toy box, as you know, here at KGW, and we need your help to fill it. Drop off a new unwrapped toy at your nearest Regents, Wells Fargo, or Toyota dealership, or at our main KGW studios. We're at 15th in Jefferson, and we're collecting through December 15th. Have a magic box. Bring your toy now. Well, for weeks, we've been asking for your help to make this the best year ever for the KGW Great Toy Drive. Now, all we have to say is thank you. Yeah, many, many times over because the support for this year's drive has been incredible. And there are going to be a lot of happy kids come Christmas morning. As we get to the front here, I can tell you that there's actually more toys right there. 
Those are all the toys that have actually been gone through, rebagged, and are ready for distribution later this week. We've counted these toys. Over 50,000 toys in this blue pile of bags alone. Still have to go through these toys. Where the news comes first. News Channel 8 at 11 starts now. He was, he was carrying a gun running after one of our teachers. I just want to hold her. I just want to hold her tight. Can you imagine what it's like to not have a student get off a bus? And I, I guess I would just ask all Oregonians to hold them and their thoughts and their hearts and their prayers. Good evening, I'm Laurel Porter in the KGW Studios. And I'm Joe Don, live at Reynolds High School, the site of so much terror and so many tears today. Just after eight o'clock this morning, police say a lone gunman walked into the gymnasium, then down into the locker room where he opened fire. One student was shot and killed. He's been identified as 14-year-old Emilio Hoffman, just a freshman here at Reynolds High School. This was the man who was wounded. He's Todd Rispler, a very popular teacher and track coach. He was actually able to activate the school lockdown procedure even after he was shot. Now, at this point tonight, police are not releasing much information about the shooter, only that he was found dead a short time after Hoffman was shot and killed. But NBC News is reporting he was a student here, but so far we do not know anything more about his identity. Tonight, though, it was not the shooter. It was those who were shot, who were the focus of students, staff, and even strangers who attended two vigils tonight. We have extensive team coverage, beginning with Mike Benner, who has more on the student who was killed. We are also going to talk with Catherine Cook, who has more information on the teacher who was injured. But we begin tonight with News Channel 8's Reggie Akee. He attended those two vigils tonight, and he joins us now from a school not far from here, the site of one of those vigils. Reggie? Yeah, I'm at a middle school and the first vigil was at a church earlier. This is the second vigil that finished up just a few minutes ago. And I had a chance just moments ago to talk to the vice, one of the vice principals from Reynolds High School. And what she said really struck me because she said she really believes that it was the actions of the teachers and staff and fellow students which made it possible for her and the rest of the student body to be here tonight, hundreds of them, in order to honor the young man who wasn't able to be here, the one who lost his life. She really thinks that the quick action of many of her staff members saved so many lives. Take a listen to what she had to say to me. When I came to the vigil tonight, I, I discovered how humanity seems to rise above sometimes these type of tragic situations. So always remember to say, I love you, and always try to leave saying something positive because you just don't know what could happen in the next minute. Throughout the vigil tonight, people would start singing songs. Amazing Grace was one of them, and it would start with just a few people. It would grow to a larger group until the whole crowd was singing the song. And as loud as that was, you could still hear sobbing in the background. I'm told by those who are familiar with Emilio Hoffman's family that it was one of his sisters mourning her big brother tonight. Standing right next to her and next to Emilio's mother in this vigil, Governor John Kitzhaber. I spoke to him right after the first vigil and before he came over here to this middle school to get his thoughts about this very long and trying day. I guess I would just ask all Oregonians to hold them and their thoughts and their hearts and their prayers. And, and I guess also to ask ourselves how we managed to build a society where our young people have active shooter drills. That is the governor tonight speaking about a, once again, another tragedy here in Oregon. Over this past week, of course, we have lost two students now, one of them at 
uh, Pacific uh, University in Seattle, and then the other one just today at Reynolds High School. One of the things, Joe, that I uh, am going to take away from tonight is talking from a, to a student who uh, is friends with Emilio, knows him and his friends, and she said she was hunkered down for two hours in her classroom, Facebooking, texting her friends to just make sure they're all okay, and Emilio was the one who just kept on coming up silent for them, and it wasn't until hours later they figured out why. Back to you. Uh, yeah, it's been a long and difficult day for so many, Reggie, and I think one of the things I'll take away for sure after spending the entire day with so many of these students was just how impressive they were and uh, how calm they were and how collected they were in the light of this traumatic and very difficult day. But that's something for sure this whole uh, community should be proud of, and that's how these students handle this situation. Let's bring in my colleague now, Kylie Boshi, who's been on this investigation all day. He joins us now. We haven't learned a whole lot, Kyle, understandably, but it sounds like we may learn more tomorrow. Well, the next official police update will be tomorrow morning, late tomorrow morning. At that time, we anticipate learning more about the shooting, including possibly his identity. As you mentioned, Joe, earlier, NBC News citing law enforcement sources suggest the shooter is a student here, but we still don't know where he got the gun, how he got it into the school, or what prompted the shooting. Tonight, police stand guard. Reynolds High School remains an active crime scene after a campus shooting that left two dead, including a freshman student and the gunman. We, did, we thought it was just a drill, and then they announced that it was real. Emotion just feels you that you just got to touch him and know that he's okay. The first reports came in shortly after 8 a.m., the start of the school day. We got a report of shots fired in the locker room, at least one person down. There. Dozens of police officers raced to the scene in Troutdale. Oregon's second largest high school went into lockdown. Students huddled in classrooms while heavily armed police officers searched the campus. I mean, you hear it on the news and you think, yeah, it sucks, but it can't be that bad. But when you see it happen in your own school with all your real friends and your teachers that you've gotten to know over three, four years, it's just, it's intense. Investigators say a lone gunman shot and killed a 14-year-old student in a gymnasium locker room. Emilio Hoffman is described as a great kid loved by all. The shooter, armed with a rifle, died at the scene. A track coach and PE teacher, Todd Rispler, was injured. He was grazed by a bullet. Frantic parents raced to the school waiting for news. I just want to hold her. Just want to hold her tight and get her home. Students were evacuated by bus, then reunited with anxious parents. You can't describe in words how you feel up here waiting for your student to get off the bus. Can you imagine what it's like to not have a student get off the bus? The inherent belief that our children are in a safe place has been shattered. So all of us are going to take pause. We're going to be grateful for what we have and cherish our children. And they want to make sure every day that they're safe when they when they leave our and all hands, so to speak. Outside Reynolds High School, neighbors dropped off flowers, a sign of hope after a day filled with tragedy and fear. And throughout the evening, we've seen students and staff come and pick up their vehicles from the parking lot. Remember, they had to drop everything and run when the evacuation from the school occurred. Tomorrow, they'll have an opportunity to come back and pick up some of their other belongings. But, Joe, getting back into the school, that may take some time because, obviously, it's still a crime scene. Right. School closed tomorrow, and the district says it will remain closed until further notice. Kyle, thank you very much. One other point we want to make, Portland police say they will have increased security at several Portland schools. Also, that includes David Douglas, Park Rose, and Reynolds, just to give parents and students a little bit more sense of security. Now, once students were cleared from the school here at Reynolds today after this shooting, police still stopped and searched and in some cases patted down some of the students before they were allowed to get on buses and then sent over to the Fred Meyer here in Wood Village where they were reunited with their parents. And we want to share with you now a picture that we got from a viewer of a girl outside the school being patted down by officers. They did not find anything on this student. I want to make that clear, but it's just a picture to give you an idea of what was happening at the time after this shooting at school. But it is important also to point out that in another search, police did find a second gun. Police say they do not believe it was related to today's shooting, but nonetheless, that student with the second gun was arrested. As we know tonight, Emilio Hoffman was the only student killed by the gunman today, and by all accounts from a family spokesman, Emilio was very well known and very well liked. Our team coverage continues now 
with News Channel 8's Mike Benner. He spoke tonight with someone who knew Emilio very well. Mike? I did, Joe. Her name is Kayla Ensign. She tells us she dated Emilio Hoffman last year and again this year. It was one of those off and on sort of things, one of those things that kids that age do. But through all of their breakups, they managed to remain the best of friends. And that's what made what happened today so difficult. I wish I could have said goodbye or told him how, he, how much he meant to me, but I know he knows. Kayla Ensign considered Emilio Hoffman one of her closest friends. That's why he was the first person she tried contacting when the lockdown at Reynolds High School was finally lifted. Kept texting him, kept calling him, and then I saw his mom. Together, the two looked for Emilio, but he was nowhere to be found. It wasn't until hours later that Kayla learned he was the student gunned down in the boys' locker room. I broke down. It was horrible. I mean, I saw all my friends crying, and everyone was hugging me and kept apologizing. Emilio was a special kid, a lot more than a soccer star. Kayla says he was warm-hearted, honest, smart, and funny. She says he would always put others first, including her. I would have some of the hardest days in my life, and he would make me smile. I'm sorry. It's okay. It's almost like you want him here right now to kind of get you through this whole yeah. thing. I was like, I came home and I was just in denial, like... Like, I'm gonna wake up and tomorrow he's gonna be there. Making matters even worse, Kayla can't think of anyone who would want to hurt Emilio. Just, he's just so amazing and great, and it really hurts to, like, know that I'm going to wake up tomorrow and he's not going to be here. But the memories will be, like trips to the pumpkin patch. It's those sort of experiences that Kayla will hold close to her heart. I just want everyone to know that he was a really good kid, that he really didn't deserve what he got, and that he's somewhere better. Kayla says she talked with Emilio as recently as this morning in the hallway. They were joking about his outfit, of all things. So Kayla's going to bed tonight knowing her final conversation with Emilio was filled with laughter. Joe? Well, you can certainly hear the pain in her voice. Mike, thank you very much for that report. We want to share a little bit more now on the teacher who's being called a hero tonight, the man who managed to activate the lockdown situation here in the school, even though he had been grazed by a bullet in this shooting. We're joined now by one of that teacher's former students. Our own News Channel 8's Catherine Cook graduated from here at Reynolds High School, and she joins me now live with more. Been a tough day for you, too, I know, Catherine. It certainly has, Joe, and I am a proud graduate of Reynolds High School. I'm also proud to say Todd Rispler was my track coach, my mentor, and my friend. He always wants to bring out the best in students, and today, he helped bring them out of harm's way. I mean, he's, he's like one of the best teachers in school. He's honestly one of my favorite teachers. Students at Reynolds High School say Todd Rispler put their lives ahead of his own. I saw that he had blood on the side of his shirt. Rispler had just been grazed on the hip by a bullet in the school's gym. That didn't stop the 50-year-old PE and health teacher from doing something Troutdale police call heroic. I would also like to extend my appreciation to teacher Todd Rispler, who despite being injured, was able to make his way to the office and initiate the school lockdown procedure. News of the shooting spread fast. It was really scary because when we were in the class, all we kept hearing like someone figured out that Rispler was shot, but nobody knew actually what happened. And so we didn't know if he was okay or if he wasn't okay. They know he's okay now, and so are they. For his bravery, um, knowing how to handle things, being calm. He was just, he was just being like everybody else and saying it's okay, you know, we're just trying to get through this, like get on the buses, get home, get to your families. It's no wonder he's their favorite teacher. Something else you might not know about Todd Rispler, he too graduated from Reynolds High School where he was a star athlete. If you're watching at home tonight, coach, I want you to know we're proud of you. Back to you. Catherine, thank you very much. Nice touch. And as you can see here, a couple more people have arrived here at Reynolds High School, as have a handful over the last 15 or 20 minutes to light candles and leave flowers at the marker outside the school here. A very nice touch for sure. I think we talked throughout the day about events that happened during our own high school years that we all remember, whether you lose a classmate in a car accident or to some other death. 
uh, it's something we all remember their names, right? And we thought today that this is something that not only all these students, but certainly this entire community will remember for a long, long time. Laurel, that'll wrap up our coverage from Reynolds High School tonight. We'll send it back to you in the studio now. Well, powerful, powerful stories. And as Governor Kitzhaber said earlier in our coverage, I think all of us hold the Reynolds community in our hearts and we send them our support tonight. Thank you, Joe, and to the night team out there on the scene. But our coverage of the Reynolds High School shooting isn't over. The country has to do some soul searching about this. This is becoming the norm and we take it for granted. President Obama frustrated and angered by today's shooting, the reaction from the White House to Capitol Hill. Plus, how do you talk to your children about something like this? A psychologist weighs in. You can add your message of condolences to the victims and words of support for students and staff at Reynolds. We have set up a post on the KGW Facebook page, and we'll be right back. News of the shooting at Reynolds High School got a strong reaction from the White House and Capitol Hill. On the floor of the House, Oregon Congressman Earl Blumenauer tearfully called for a moment of silence. And President Obama called the string of campus shootings his biggest frustration. The shooting at Troutdale's Reynolds High follows another campus shooting at Seattle Pacific University just last week. A gunman killed 19-year-old student Paul Lee of Beaverton and injured three others. Two weeks before that, a rampage on the campus of UC Santa Barbara left six dead and the gunman. During a Q&A session today hosted by Tumblr, President Obama expressed anger and said not being able to stop the shootings is his biggest frustration. We're the only developed country on earth where this happens. And it happens now once a week. And it, it's a one day story. There's no place else like this. Last year, Congress failed to pass a bipartisan bill drafted in response to the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary in Newtown, Connecticut. 20 school children died and six adults. The bill would have expanded background checks for gun purchases. Oregon Congressman Earl Blumenauer was shaken by the news of the shooting at Reynolds. It's in his district. I was there recently. The kids gave me a wooden bow tie with a bicycle on it. The congressman tweeted a picture of it and sent his thoughts and prayers to families affected by the tragedy. Surrounded by his four colleagues in the Oregon House, he choked up as he called for a moment of silence. I would ask Mr. Speaker that the House observe a moment of silence and support for the victims, their families, and the community. Observe a moment of silence. <laughs> The congressman tweeted he hopes the tragedy will inspire action and called for universal background checks. We're going to shift our attention now to the weather. Our Rod Hill is standing by and we have some rain on the way, Rod, but one more nice day. That's right. Beautiful today. The showers we talked about as a possibility did stay well up to our north. There's a dab around Seattle. That was about it. We're partly cloudy tonight, 61 degrees uh, from our Wells Fargo Center camera. Here are the temperatures to expect when you get up tomorrow morning. A lot of you will be in the 40s again, low 50s likely here in the Rose City. I'm going 53 in my forecast. Could be some early cloudiness around, not expecting much. Generally speaking, just another sunny day. 65 at noon and the high temp tomorrow, a little bit warmer. It was 74 today, forecasting 77 tomorrow. This active flow pattern that didn't do anything to us today, but this curl of clouds you see right here, is a system that is absolutely likely to bring us our first measurable rainfall of the month of June. And again, that's set for Thursday. Futurecast shows this rain, some of it heavy offshore, where you see the yellow and the orange colors. Just offshore at 7 in the morning on uh, Thursday. By 1 o'clock in the afternoon, starting to move into the uh, Portland Salem metro areas, especially northward up to uh, Kelso Longview. And once this starts, I think we'll have a likelihood of showers in the area all the way through Friday morning. Now, if you have plans Friday night, we could get a break, meaning the rain showers could be over at some point during the afternoon. Here's our forecast for tomorrow. Another great day. All of the beach uh, expected to have sunshine 
after an early clouds. We have a little bit of cloudiness right now up around Astoria. Your high tomorrow will be 62. And up and down the Lama Valley, we'll get up to about 78 degrees in Salem, up into southwest Washington, Kelso, 74 degrees. On the mountain tomorrow, Gurman Camp up into the 60s. Timberline will be in the 50s, a beautiful sunny day. Winds expected generally to be light at all elevations. And out east, a light wind day too. The red flag warnings that were posted for the Columbia Basin, where it's been really gusty, including today. Those winds will be calmer tomorrow, so the red flag warnings have been lifted, which means fire danger not as critical as it has been. The Dow's 83, Hood River 79, west winds mainly breezy near the Hood River Valley tomorrow, and that's about it in the gorge. Our forecast numbers, so tomorrow great 77. Thursday, the much needed rain into Friday morning. Could be dry Friday evening. Could be dry much of Saturday with the best chance of weekend rain Saturday night into Sunday morning. Another shower chance on Monday, and then right now Tuesday looks dry. Quick update on the two bulls fire. Uh, the last update was actually posted this morning, and at that time, the fire was 25% contained, up from only 5%, and had not grown. We'll have more on that, of course, updated tomorrow. KGW News back after this. This is something that happens other places, not something that happens here. We heard that over and over today. So how do you help our kids cope with a tragedy like the one at Reynolds that hits so close to home? The night team's Art Edwards joins us now. And Art, you talk with some experts about this. Well, I did. You know, there is no doubt that this is going to be a difficult time for an awful lot of people. It is important that parents and their children have the support they need to help them cope with this tragic event. The healing process started in the parking lot of the Fred Meyer store, an emotional scene as parents and students were reunited. Everything from anxiety to sadness and relief. The experts say it is important that parents look hard at what's happened and begin to deal with the tragedy themselves. I think the first thing that has to happen is for parents to uh, take care of themselves, so to speak. If they're not a, a good space emotionally, if they're scattered, if they're overwhelmed, it's hard for them to interact with their uh, children in a helpful manner. We've heard from the students and parents. I didn't believe it at all. I, was, I, thought, I thought it was a drill at first, and then it was serious. Sheer terror, panic, everything. The worst thing runs through your mind when you know that there's somebody running around the school shooting. A child psychologist we talked with says it is important to go beyond just a quick chat with your children. I think it's really important to go beneath the surface, that there is a lot of uh, uh, anxiety and underlying sadness, and really to connect with their child. Now, the experts we talked to also say no matter what, parents have to figure out a way to talk with their children about these kinds of issues. Laurel. Thank you, Art. Crisis counselors were available throughout the day today, and they will be available at every school in the district tomorrow. They'll also be at Mount Hood Community College from 7 in the morning until 7 in the evening. You can call them 24 hours a day. Here's the number, 503-988-4888. We'll be right back. On this difficult day, KGW viewers sent in their condolences throughout the day through the KGW Facebook page. More than 100 messages on the page so far, many offering prayers for the families involved. And you can add to those messages and share your words of support to students and staff at Reynolds. It's all through the KGW Facebook page. We'll have a final word for you next. We want to remind you that crisis counselors will be available tomorrow from 7 in the morning until 7 in the evening. And we thank you for joining us tonight. Be sure to hug your kids, tell your friends and your family that you love them. On this difficult day, it's a good reminder. From all of us here at KGW, thank you and good night.